Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The FCC celebrates its 84th anniversary. Amateur radio is honored across the country in advance of Field Day 2018. The assigning of Z6 call signs in Kosovo is declared unauthorized and illegal by the ITU General Secretary. Iranian radar is showing up on the 10-meter band. Canadian radio amateurs petition Parliament to end what appears to be deliberate interference. The space station digital amateur television system appears to be defective and non-repairable on board. And with 300 kilowatts from Rittenberg via Vienna to North America. What is it? We'll tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites orbiting the Earth. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to talk about VPNs and the EU's General Data Protection Regulation. Australia's own Anno Ben Shop, VK6FLAB, suggests that you get a contesting buddy. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, will be here with a look at another one of amateur radio's fallen flags. This week, he looks at Hammerland. That and a lot more are all straight ahead as special field day edition number 1008 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio in Albany, New York, where, as usual, I spend field day right here, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from the emerald green and slightly soggy Catskill Mountains of New York State, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where Mother Nature finally found spring and is letting us borrow it for a short visit, it's going to warm up again next week, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Reporting live from the K9IG News Bureau, where it's sunny and beautiful, this is Amy Jo Clark. This Week in Amateur Radio, headline news begins now. The Federal Communications Commission turns 84 years old on June 19th. The FCC tweeted, the FCC came into being in 1934 as an independent agency of the federal government when Congress passed the Communications Act of 1934, abolishing the Federal Radio Commission, the FRC, created in 1912 after the Titanic disaster and transferring jurisdiction over radio licensing, including amateur radio licensing, to the new FCC. According to its website, the FCC regulates interstate and international communications by radio, television, wire, satellite, and cable in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and U.S. territories, and it implements and enforces U.S. communications law and regulations. The FCC is composed of five commissioners appointed by the president who must undergo confirmation by the U.S. Senate. The president designates one of the members as the FCC chairman. Radio amateurs in Canada, primarily in the province of Quebec, have mounted a petition drive demanding that members of the House of Commons prompt decisive regulatory action against a Quebec resident who has been causing deliberate interference. The petition does not spell out the particulars of the allegations, but says the alleged offender, apparently unlicensed, is already known to authorities. Petitioners claim that the individual's malicious intentions have been threatening the security of emergency radio communication in the province, and they called upon parliamentary lawmakers to ensure the security of HF radio communication. For two years, a Nicolette resident near Trois-Rivières in Quebec illegally set up a transmitting radio station and is generating interference on purpose, the petition recounts. Amateur radio operators in Quebec have identified the illegal radio station and brought it to the attention of Innovation, Science and Economic Development, or ICED Canada, and its inspector sees the individual's radio equipment. One of ICED's functions is telecommunications regulation. According to the petition, the alleged offender acquired new equipment right away and returned to jamming the airwaves. The petition identifies the alleged offender as a male who is known to police in Nicolette and Trois-Rivières and has regular encounters with the law. 
We are calling on the government to provide more support to the Department of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development Canada so that it can intervene more decisively in this matter, the petition declared. Radio Amateurs of Canada, the country's national amateur radio organization, was noncommittal. While we have not had a chance to investigate the specific details of the incidents that the petition refers to, we agree with the importance of acting to support the security of high-frequency communications, RAC said this week. As of June 12th, the online petition had gathered more than 625 signatures, primarily from Quebec and Ontario. Canada has more than 50,000 amateur radio licensees. Each year as ARRL Field Day approaches, state and local governments traditionally take advantage of the opportunity to honor amateur radio in the form of various proclamations. This list of those that took part is not necessarily comprehensive. In Alabama, Governor Kay Ivey proclaimed June 18th through the 24th as Amateur Radio Week. A delegation of radio amateurs from around the state were on hand as Governor Ivey signed the proclamation. In Idaho, Governor C. L. Butch Otter has proclaimed June 18th through the 24th as Amateur Radio Week. The proclamation declares that amateur radio has proved its relevance in the modern world by providing emergency communications when other systems failed in the wake of hurricanes and other disasters. In Massachusetts, at the urging of State Senator Bruce Tarr, N1UIU, Massachusetts Governor Charles Baker signed a proclamation declaring June 24th as Amateur Radio Day in the Bay State. In South Carolina, Governor Henry McMaster has declared the week of June 18th through the 24th as Amateur Radio Week. He encouraged South Carolinians to recognize radio amateurs for their many contributions, including emergency communications and other public service work, to the continued safety of the residents of the Palmetto State. In the state of Washington, Governor Jay Inslee proclaimed the week of June 18th through the 24th as Amateur Radio Week, encouraging recognition of the importance of amateur radio operators on whom we can rely during emergencies or disasters within the state. The Orange Park, Florida Town Council designated June 18th through the 24th as Amateur Radio Week, recognizing amateur radio's role in furthering international goodwill as well as its public service in disasters, emergencies, and during public events. The Town Board of Cicero, New York, recognized the Liverpool Amateur Radio Club for its fundamental role in disaster communications for the town. The Town Board cited LARC's participation in Field Day at William Park on Field Day weekend. The City Council of Goose Creek, South Carolina, proclaimed June 17th through the 23rd as Amateur Radio Week. Mayor Greg Habib said radio amateurs further demonstrate their value in public assistance by providing free radio communications for local events. The City of Midland, Michigan, proclaimed June 18th through the 24th as Amateur Radio Week in that community, recognizing the efforts of ham radio operators, especially during times of emergency. Mayor Maureen Donker presented Midland Amateur Radio Club President Al Bailey with the proclamation on June 11th during a City Council meeting. The Volusia County, Florida County Council has designated June 17th through the 24th as CQ Florida Amateur Radio Week, honoring amateur radio generally and the group CQ Florida in particular. The council urged residents to honor amateur radio operators for providing a bridge between peoples, societies, and countries by creating friendships and sharing information. In Ohio, the Hancock County Commission designated June 18th through the 24th as Amateur Radio Week, noting that the Hancock Oxcom team will host a field day event at Clark Field in Newell. More than 1,400 clubs and groups in the U.S. and Canada have let ARRL know of their plans to be on the air for field day by registering their locations on the field day locator page. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The World Radio Sport Team Championship, or WRTC, is to be covered in two special broadcasts by Radio DARC. 
The radio show of the German Amateur Radio Club, E.V, will broadcast a program in English on Saturday, July 14th, from 1100 to 1200 UTC, using the 49-meter shortwave band at 6070 kilohertz. Especially for the many people interested in WRTC from North America, the program will also be broadcast on 13860 kilohertz at the same time. The six-hour time difference makes it possible for the show to serve as a breakfast radio, WRTC News, on the east coast of North America. There's expected to be a high level of interest from North America, as not only did a total of 14 teams from North America qualify, but also the defending champions Daniel Craig, N6MJ, and Chris Hurlbut, KL9A, are from the USA. A day later, on Sunday the 15th, the second broadcast will be set at 9 o'clock UTC. Both broadcasts, which can be received all over Europe as well as North America, will, as well as covering the region and the people in the Wittenberg and Jessen areas, also include content from journalists reporting on current WRTC events. What the World Championship is all about and how it works will be presented. Behind-the-scenes reports will cover the qualifying process, the competitors and their four-year preparation, as well as the efforts of all the volunteers on this mammoth project. The contest rules and award programs will be explained. Tips will be given on technology and use to make those DX contacts, and the all-important radio propagation report completes the WRTC special program. The transmitters, which can reach 300,000 listeners in many parts of the world, are located in Vienna, Austria. The Radio DARC program regularly airs on Sundays at 9 o'clock a.m. UTC at 6070 kilohertz in the 49-meter band and covers current news from amateur radio and shortwave sectors, equipment reports, technology tips, and interviews along with varied music. Radio DARC is unique in the magazine format worldwide and is now the last remaining long, medium, or shortwave broadcast show that's voluntarily produced in Germany by radio amateurs. While 10 meters has not been the hottest band in amateur radio's toolkit of late, Iran apparently has found it an ideal spot to operate various radars. For more details on this late-breaking story, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from ARRL headquarters in Newington. The interference was audible in International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 and perhaps elsewhere in the world. Quote, Iranian radars were very active on our 10-meter band every day, reported IARU Monitoring System Coordinator for Region 1, Wolf Hadel, DK2OM. On 28.860 MHz, we could daily receive the strong and long-lasting signals. Other frequencies were used in frequency hopping mode." Unquote. The list of additional amateur radio intruders on 10 meters included, or in some cases no longer included, some of the usual suspects. Hadel reported that FM signals from Russian taxi dispatchers, driftnet fishery buoys, and citizens band users in Brazil have been operating on various 10 meter frequencies. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. Meanwhile, some chronic intruding signals have disappeared. Among the missing is the 14.295 harmonic from Radio Tajik on 4.765 kHz, Radio Harjasaya in Somaliland on 7,120 kHz is said to have been off the air for several weeks due to a transmitter failure. We did not miss the transmissions, quipped Hadel, who has also expressed the hope that the broadcast battle between Radio Eritrea and Radio Ethiopia on 40 meters may now be at an end. For some time now, Radio Eritrea contended with Ethiopian white noise interference on 7,140 and 7,180 kilohertz. This month, Ethiopia announced it would accept a peace deal with Eritrea to end the bloody 20-year-old dispute. Hadel reported a hybrid modem signal for a few days in May on 14.000 megahertz from the Israeli Navy, consisting of six precarriers of PSK4 Parallel and MIL 188-110A Modified. Just below 20 meters on 13.998, the transmissions of FSK-16 from Russia were observed on May 31st. The signal was heard up to 14.01-165 MHz in the amateur band. Two major de-expeditions are on track to make many de-Xers happy campers this year. 
Just ahead is the KH1-KH7Z Baker Island de-expedition, which commemorates the 81st anniversary of aviator Amelia Earhart's disappearance on July 2, 1937, near Baker and Howland Islands, as well as the commitment and sacrifices of the Hui Panalaau, which loosely translates to Society of Colonists, young high school graduates from Hawaii, who were taken to colonize Baker, Howland, and Jarvis Islands from 1935 until 1942, and who began construction of a runway for Earhart to land in 1937. The islands were bombed the day after Pearl Harbor, killing two, and the colonists were removed by the U.S. Coast Guard in 1942. The team's enthusiasm level was reported to be high as the KH-1-KH-7Z Baker Island team prepared to depart Pago Pago, American Samoa, on June 20th aboard the Naia en route to Baker Island. The de-expedition is scheduled to fire up around 0000 UTC on June 28th with eight operating positions active on all open bands. The team will be on the air around the clock and on 20 meters continuously for the following 10 days. The KH-1-KH-7Z team consists of 14 operators. But any plan is only good until you meet the enemy in the field of battle, the Baker Island de-expedition team said in a news release. We plan on listening to our pilots. Please tell them if we are missing an opening or opportunity. We can and will adjust to the propagation. Baker Island is the fifth most wanted DXCC entity, according to Club Log. As reported, KH1KH7X will employ FT8 digital mode to find openings that might not be obvious and to serve as a beacon. When we find an opening, we will put as many radios, modes, ops on as we can, the team said. The KH1KH7X group helped to develop the WSJTX software version that incorporates an FT8 de-expedition mode version 1.9.0. The de-expedition said using FD8 de-expedition mode may allow the operators to expand bands they are able to use at this point in the solar cycle. The de-expedition's band plan page includes a guide to using FD8 de-expedition mode. The Dateline DX Association is sponsoring the de-expedition to Baker Island. The Pacific Islands Refuges and Monuments Office of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service granted the club permission to land and operate on the uninhabited island. Meanwhile, the VP6D Dushi Island de-expedition reports that its preparations remain on schedule for its October 20th to November 3rd operation. The de-expedition has announced that 15-year-old Mason Matrasso, KM4SII of Clemens, South Carolina, will join the VP6D pilot team. In 2017, he operated from Iceland as TF slash KM4SII. And on July 2018, he will operate from Curaçao as PJ2 slash KM1SII. Mason will work with North America and Chief Pilot Glenn Petrie, KE4KY. The Braveheart, owned by Nigel Jolly, K6NRJ, will transport the 14-member Dushi Island team to its South Pacific destination in September, sailing from Mangareva, French Polynesia. The Perseverance DX Group is sponsoring the VP6 The Expedition. Dushi Island is the 26th most wanted DXCC entity, according to Club Log. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, June 22nd. All eyes are on field day this weekend, and it looks as though the sun might be cooperating. Several sunspots are visible, and they're growing. Now, this means a risk for solar flares. In fact, we've had a C-class flare already. But it also means a significant boost in the solar flux index, which is already up to 82. As long as we can avoid a flare, conditions on the upper HF bands might be promising for field day. Already, 10 meters has been opening occasionally for transcontinental sideband contacts. 
There is a chance that we could be grazed by a stream of solar particles this weekend, but the risk of geomagnetic disturbances is relatively low. On VHF and UHF, don't forget to set up a 6-meter station at your field day site. The band has been hot for the last couple of weeks, with almost daily sporadic E openings. On the west coast and in the central U.S., be on the lookout for tropospheric ducting openings to put in field day appearances, especially on 2 meters and up. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. You may not be aware, besides having the radios to complete school contacts and some random contacts, plus a digipeter on board the ISS, there's also an Eris ham TV system. Back in April, the transmitter in the Columbus module decided to stop working. Without a way to repair it in space, it will have to be sent in for repairs. Yes, it will be returned to Earth, be repaired, and then tested and sent back to the ISS. However, to make the round trip takes more than just placing it in a box and sending it. There has to be approval from the related space agencies as well as the cost involved. More information on the HAM TV can be found on the amsat-on.be website. Thanks to Gaston, ON4WF, and the Eris HAM TV for this story. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. A 100 kilowatt shortwave broadcast transmitter in Germany will be sending digital field day greetings to North American radio amateurs in the MFS K64 mode. This will be during the weekly music and DJ broadcast of the mighty KBC on 9925 kilohertz at midnight to 0200 UTC on Sunday, June 24th. The MFS K64 transmission, centered on 1500 hertz, begins at about 0130 UTC. An RSID will be transmitted just before the transmission to guide decoding software to the correct mode and audio frequency. You can send reception reports to the mighty KBC at gmail.com. Kosovo, which won its battle to become a DXCC entity earlier this year, appears to have another fight on its hands. For more on this late-breaking story, we go to League Headquarters in Newington, where Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, files this report. International Telecommunication Union Secretary General Hu Lin Zhao has determined that Z6 call sign prefix was never allocated to Kosovo. The Secretary General issued his finding in the wake of a March 16th inquiry from Serbia, from which Kosovo declared independence 10 years ago, the last piece of the former Yugoslavia to do so. Serbia has continued to reject Kosovo's secession. The Secretary General cited Article 19 of the radio regulations, which states that the management of international series of call signs is an ITU prerogative. Kosovo joins a short list of DXCC entities where radio amateurs use unofficial call sign prefixes. The list also includes Western Sahara, S0, and the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, 1A. Earlier this year, in Mission Goodwill Kosovo, the IARU Member Society Headquarters Station Z6OA mounted a massive special event operation to celebrate Kosovo's addition to the DXCC list, as well as its 10th anniversary of independence. Avenues to resolve the call sign prefix issue for Kosovo are all fraught with possible roadblocks. In addition to possible action at World Radio Communication Conference 2019, which could run into Serbian opposition, Kosovo's telecommunications regulator could decide to assign call signs from a block the ITU is not using. The ITU has not allocated call sign series Z6 to any of its member states, Hulan Zhu said. Consequently, the utilization of call signs series Z6 by any entity without a formal allocation and consent of ITU represents an unauthorized and illegal usage of this international numbering resource. Call sign series can be allocated only to the administrations of the ITU member states by World Radio Communication Conferences or between conferences by the ITU Secretary General, asserted Hulan Zhu, who gave no indication that he would do so. In July 2010, the International Court of Justice found that Kosovo's Declaration of Independence was not in violation of international law. Relations between the two nations have become less hostile in recent years, but Serbia likely would oppose any move on Kosovo's part to normalize the Z6 call sign block with the ITU. Foundations of Amateur Radio
There is a solitude about amateur radio, sitting in your shack, listening to the bands, trying to locate an elusive station, and if you're doing a contest, then even that can be something that you do alone. Don't get me wrong, I like my own company as much as the next introvert, but there is much joy to be found in finding a companion. Over the years, I've participated in group activities, camping, field days, contests, activations, antenna building, ham fests and the like. These activities have been excellent and I highly recommend that you attempt to find a local community where you can connect with other amateurs to find common ground and explore this hobby together. Last week I did a contest with a friend, each on our own but doing the same contest at the same time. The contest itself was what can only be described as a fizzer. For my eight hours or so of operating I managed a grand total of one contact, and that wasn't even with my friend. What made the experience one to remember is that I wasn't alone in the activity. I wasn't the only one having the experience. I was able to share my single contact and know that my friend didn't fare much better, that they had been in the same boat and came out just as wet. It's not the first time I've done a contest with a single friend. This time we did it as two stations, each under our own call sign. But previously I've participated in contests where it was just two of us that were working the same call sign both trying our best to contribute as much as we could. The thrill of doing this is like nothing else I have experienced, and I would highly recommend that you try it. My tips for success are that you agree on a common understanding of why you're there. If one of you is wanting to lark about and the other is serious, the experience will end in tears. One of the things I've done in the past is to agree on operator rotation. For one contest we set a hard limit of two hours per operator, and between us we covered most of the 48 hours of the contest and we managed enough sleep to stay sane. Operating two radios doesn't, in my experience, work very well if you're both working in the same shack. That's not to say that there is hardware that can fix that, but so far it's been elusive at best and at least frustrating. My quest for coax stub filter bliss continues. Motivation is a big deal. Encouraging the other person, making them a coffee at 2am in the morning, Listening in and laughing helps and makes the experience one of joy. Learning and observation is a useful spin-off from this. I've done this with people with more, sometimes decades more experience than I, and with those who have less experience. Giving feedback, write it down, don't interrupt the contest unless it's a rule breaker, and talking about it after the fact will make both of you better operators, and that's not a bad outcome by any measurement. Backseat driving isn't okay. If the other person is operating a pile-up, let them operate it. Their ears are not yours, and your interjection of a call sign you heard is likely to end up in frustration for both. That's not to say that you can't do this together, just talk about it before you start helping. One of the most rewarding aspects of this whole process is that you get to see another person doing what you're doing, and the differences in style between the two of you is often a learning experience for both not to mention a shared history that will continue well after the contest is finished and forgotten. Over the years I've now managed around half a dozen contests with a single other person, sometimes in their shack, in a club shack, on a campout, or in a car, mobile, and I have to say that it's the most fun I've had along the way. For all I know, that kind of fun can be had in a contest station that has an operator for every band with equipment coming out of every corner, but I haven't experienced that yet, so I can't comment. Find yourself a contesting buddy to share the highs and lows, and before you know it, you'll be having more fun than you've had before. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha, Bravo. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. And I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California, This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Let me just log in here to my computer. And let's see, what is, uh, what is new in the tech world? But let's talk a little bit about this. So VPN filter, we believe, I, we, not me personally, but uh, the people who discovered it and have done the research on it was created, and, and this is what makes it so deadly, by a nation state, in this case Russia, 
and by a Russia hacking group called Fancy Bear. They've had many names, but that's one of the names they go by. The reason that's an issue, and the re first of all, you can tell when a, when malware is created by a nation state because it's so darn good. When you know when hackers create stuff, they're usually a little sloppier, <laughs> and they're definitely not so careful. In this case, uh, VPN filter has different clauses for ev for every possible router. If you're an Asus AC3200, do this. If you're, it is so carefully programmed that it's clearly done by a, 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 an actor with lots with unlimited resources, effectively unlimited resources, and that's why the lists that we've seen so far of affected routers are incomplete. You just don't know if your router is uh, is affected and it's probably safe to assume that the russians are continuing to expand its reach remember the fbi uh, saying a couple of weeks ago oh everybody reboot your routers you'll be fine we found the command and control center it was a couple of images on photo bucket and then a site called to know all.com we've got those just reboot you'll be fine wrong of course it wasn't that easy so uh our security guy steve gibson noted at that time well yeah, except that there's still, even if you reboot the router, they've modified the firmware of the router as well so that there's a little code that's beaconing. We don't know why it's beaconing, but but beaconing says saying it's saying, hey, I'm here, I'm here, hey. We don't know why it's beaconing, but you can presume the reason a router would continue to do that is to say, come back and hack me, come back and hack me. So we're seeing these routers that you rebooted hacked again. The only real solution to this and you can do this with your AC3200, which, by the way, is not, I don't think is on the list, but it's a prudent for everybody to just assume that your router is going to be on the list. There's two things to look for. And I'll, I'll tell you, the first thing you can do on any router is go out and reinstall the current firmware. That will erase the firmware that's on there, which could presumably have the fancy bear code and replace it with good code. That's the, that's the immediate fix. It'll stop beaconing. It won't re-download the malware. It won't get reinfected. Now, the good thing about Asus is they keep their software up to date. The re one of the reasons I recommended this router is it's based on open source router software called DDWRT, which Asus uses, they modify, but you can put third-party DDWRT compatible firmware on it if you're feeling like Asus is not keeping it up to date, but they are. In fact, I bet you, if you check, you've got patches since this came out. Most of the companies and this is the second point most important point if you buy a router that gets updated by the company on a regular basis and the company is paying attention you'll be fixed because they have to fix the flaw that allowed vpn filter in in the first place so check to see if there's an update on it even if there isn't reload the current most version most recent version and you're probably all right you know this is just the beginning we are uh, you can now say we're in a hot war a hot cyber war with the russians and uh, and others as well, but the Russians are the most active. Chinese to some degree as well, and both company countries. Oh, and North Korea has their own hacking group as well. All all of these countries. The thing is, that's the point. Is it doesn't. It's not like building a nuclear weapon. You get twenty good hackers, you're you're done. You just give them resources, let them get to work, and you can create tools. Now, why you might ask? Well, why would Russia be doing this? Why is Russia building a network and at last count of half a million routers impacted, infected with VPN filter? Why would they want that? Well, it's not to steal your credit card number. Don't worry. It's not about you. It's to steal your router and your bandwidth and to use it for their purposes. And we don't know what their purposes are, but you need only look at what Russia has done in Ukraine to see what they're thinking about. Russians were able to take the Ukraine grid down for some hours. They turned it back on. It was a test a couple of years ago. They have been able to do all sorts of things to Ukraine. Uh, the, Ukraine has become Russia's, they don't you know, remember, they think the Ukraine should be in Russia, a part of you know Russian territory. Remember, Russians invaded the Crimea. The reason it's often called the Ukraine is it was the Ukrainian region of Russia for many years. So uh, the Russian government kind of considers the Ukraine to be, you know, a prodigal son. And they, and they don't mind attacking it. It's a good place to test your hackers. And by the way, Ukraine has some very talented, skilled uh, tech people there. So it's a good place to kind of see what they can do in defense. But that's not the end game. The end game is, I believe, and I think our intelligence community believes, I know they believe, the end game is attacking us.
And you don't have to think too hard to imagine what it would be like if Russia took our electric grid down for a few days. What chaos that would cause. And don't you think we're not doing the same? We're absolutely. In fact, they've <laughs> we're kind of doing it explicitly and in public. We've created a cyber warfare unit. And they're working on these kinds of attacks. We know because some of them have leaked out from the NSA and elsewhere. So this, the next few years, that's what we're going to see is warfare. And unfortunately, uh, you and I and our routers and our Internet of Things devices of all kinds, anything connected to the Internet, are targets, not end game targets, targets for eventual you know, attacks against the, the, the full government. So something we need to really, uh, I think, be aware of, and, and it would be a very important thing for you to do is to start getting used to updating firmware only by devices with updatable firmware. That's super important. Uh, if the firmware can't be updated, then that device is a sitting duck. Uh, let's see, what else is uh, in the news? You know, it's turning out to be more than a speed bump for spammers. The uh, European... General Data Protection Regulation. You've probably heard about GDPR a few times. It went into effect two weeks ago, three weeks ago now. And it's killing, <laughs> I love this, it's killing email marketing. So here's why. Did you get uh, a few, <laughs> I know you knew about GDPR happening because you, in your email, you probably got a few emails saying our privacy policy has changed like a thousand from everything you've ever done business with. You didn't You didn't pay attention to those. You hit delete every time you saw one, right? Yeah, 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 fine, I don't care. Like, I care. I know you're required to do that, so I'm just, I don't care. Maybe you read a few of them. A lot of them came from, and you may not have recognized this, companies that have been sending you newsletters. I put that in air quotes. Newsletters. It's really spam, but they call them newsletters. And the GDPR has a requirement. You can't send newsletters or spam to people who haven't bought something from you. So you can send emails to customers who have purchased a product from you in the past. That's okay. But you can't send emails to people without their explicit permission otherwise. So you know how you go to a site and they say, 20% off if you just give us your email address or for whatever reason, they got your email address. There's even pages that will get your email address without you explicitly giving them that. There's a kind of a, it's a flaw in the way the web works that even if you just type something into a form, they can collect it before you hit. So maybe you're thinking, I should buy this fantastic display, Mario display that dispenses candy. I should get, no, no, I don't. I decided not to. But if you filled out the form, they got it. And they can send you email, except if you're in the European Union, then they have to send you an email saying, we would like to send you email, but we need your explicit permission. You need to say yes. So those emails you got three weeks ago, a lot of them were, were companies you didn't really want email from saying, please say yes, please, please. We'd like to send you emails. You could save so much money. If you just said yes, and I bet you just threw them out, right? Well, that means you're not going to get any more email for those companies. Now you say, but I don't live in the European Union. Yes. That's true, and technically they could treat you differently. But most companies don't because it's a lot of work to distinguish between people who live in the EU and people who live in somewhere else. So in a lot of cases, they're just doing it for everybody. So I'll be, I'll be curious, but I suspect you're going to see a lot less. We don't. It's not spam. They call it bacon. <laughs> Staying with the pork product theme, they call it bacon, which is commercial email that you signed up for or you somehow indicated an interest in, but you don't really want. It just fills your mailbox. I, have, I get a lot of bacon. I bet you do too. I have a little trick, actually, I use. It works quite well. I have a filter. Have you ever used filters in your email? This is a good thing to learn about. Oh, any email program will let you do this. Gmail does, Yahoo Mail, any, any web-based mail. Just look for filters or folders or some sort. You, rules, sometimes they call them message rules. I have a message rule. That if the word unsubscribe is anywhere in the body of the message, usually they put it way down, a little tiny print at the very bottom. If you don't want to get this, unsubscribe here. If I see the word or my filter sees the word unsubscribe in any message, it puts it all in a, in a bin called newsletters. It's just a, <laughs> quite a large bin now. <laughs> There's probably tens of thousands of emails. I haven't looked at it lately because I don't ever look at it. 
it's a it's in a bin <laughs> somewhere. And if you you know the reason you don't throw it out, you could delete it really if you wanted to. You could have that filter say just delete it. But I keep them there in case you know I want to go through it or looking for a coupon or whatever. It's still searchable and all that. So that's there's some there's some good news coming down the pipe from the General Data Protection Regulation GDPR. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Welcome to the Ancient Amateur Archives. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. In 1932, the United States was trapped in the Great Depression. The gross national product had fallen by 50% and unemployment was 25%. Despite the bleak economic forecast, or maybe because of it, amateur radio was flourishing with a 300% increase in the number of hams over a five-year period. It was during this time frame that two of the best known names in amateur radio receivers, Hallicrafters and Hammerland, came into existence. In our last installment, we charted the rise and fall of Hallicrafters. Today, let's look at Hammerland. Oscar Hammerland founded the company that bears his name in 1932. His goal was to produce top of the line receivers for amateur, military, and commercial use. By all accounts, he was successful. The first model was the Comet Super Pro. By the late 1930s, Hammerlin introduced the HQ-120X. This was a 12-tube, six-band, single conversion receiver that covered 540 kilocycles to 31 megacycles. The price in 1938 was $129. With inflation, that's about $900 today. In 1939, the company created the Super Pro model SP200, considered by many to be Hammerlin's finest pre-war receiver. Hammerlin's motto was, use the set the experts use. The SP200 featured 16 tubes in the receiver, two tubes in the separate power supply, and sold for $279, or about $2,000 today. During World War II, the military, the U.S. Signal Corps, and many governmental agencies extensively used the SP-200. After the war, Hammerlin introduced the HQ-129X, which was an updated and improved version of the HQ-120X. Incidentally, the X indicated that the receiver had a crystal filter. Other post-war single conversion receivers included the HQ-140 and the HQ-150. In the Super Pro series, Hammerlin's first post-war model was the SP-210, but it was the SP-600 introduced in 1950 that got everyone's attention. This was a large, solid, and expensive receiver. It contained 20 vacuum tubes, covered 540 kilocycles to 54 megacycles in six bands, weighed 100 pounds, and consumed 180 watts of power. The price in 1950 was $985, almost $5,000 today. A very low frequency version, the SP600 VLF, sold for more than $2,000 in 1950. $300 more than a new Studebaker. The SP600 series was produced in a variety of models until 1972 and was used extensively by the military, the FBI, the CIA, and other government and commercial organizations. The SP600 was not designed with amateur radio in mind. That, along with a price equal to the annual net income of a typical ham, kept it from being a popular amateur receiver. Although the bulk of Hammerlin's output was general coverage receivers, they also produced ham band only units such as the HQ-110, a 12-tube unit made from 1957 to 1961, and the HQ-170, a 16-tube receiver produced from 1958 to 1968. 
The HQ-170 covered 160 through 6 meters and was triple conversion with IFs of 3035, 455, and 60 kilocycles. Hammerlin's last major receiver was the HQ-180 introduced in 1959. This was a very popular general coverage receiver covering 540 kilocycles to 30 megacycles. It had 17 tubes, a triple conversion design, and sold for $439 in 1959. During the 1950s and 1960s, Hamerlin went through some changes. They moved to Mars Hill, North Carolina, and tried to expand their product line beyond just receivers. They came out with some transmitters, called the HX series, and even ventured into the CB radio market with the CB23, HQ105TR, and the HQ205. The last two units were unique in the CB radio arena, as they had a built-in shortwave receiver in addition to the CB transmitter. Unfortunately, the HX series and the CB radios were not successful and by 1969 they disappeared. By the late 1960s, Hammerland was in trouble. Their main product was the HQ-180 and its various military and commercial derivatives. Except for the HQ-215, an all-solid state receiver, the company ignored transistors. Hams no longer looked for tube-type receivers. They wanted transceivers and, by the early 1970s, solid-state 2-meter FM rigs. Even in the shrinking receiver-only market, Hammerlin faced stiff competition from Heathkit, Helicrafters, Lafayette, National, Nightkit, and Allied Radio Shack, all of whom had four or five tube shortwave radios for less than $70. The cheapest receiver Hammerland ever sold had eight tubes and cost twice as much. During the early 1970s, Hammerland tried one last PR blitz with friendly, folksy ads in QST, but it was hopeless. Why should the 1972 amateur spend $400 or more for a receiver when $350 bought a Tempo 1 transceiver? The writing was on the wall. Even National and Halicrafters, with wider product lines, were on their last legs. And so, in 1972, Hammerlin pulled the plug on the HQ-180 and the SP-600 and closed up shop. The corporate assets, including the name and trademarks, were purchased by the Cardwell Capacitor Company, who also purchased the remains of National at a bankruptcy auction. But even though the company is gone, the indestructible receivers still live on. Today, thousands of enthusiasts rediscover the romance and excitement of shortwave listening with the warm, comforting glow of a Hammerlin receiver. In this day and age of scanners and other pre-programmed receivers, have we lost the art of trolling the HF frequencies for that rare and unique catch? Perhaps we need more Hammerlin receivers in the hands of amateurs. Your time is up. Go in peace. But return again for our next installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. So, what's happened to High Frequency Packet? I'm Larry McGlure, KB9DIP. Were you active on Packet back in the 1980s or 90s? I'm probably one of the relative few who can say I was an administrative sysop on VHF UHF Packet in Chicago back then on what we called in those years a Packet Bulletin Board. One ham who remains active on HF Packet here in 2018 is this guy. My name is Sholto, Sholto Fisher. I'm K7TMG and I work at West Mountain Radio. I'm also licensed in the United Kingdom and my call sign is G7TMG. So it was made it kind of easy just to have the two calls similar. I've been doing digital modes really since the late 1980s when I was a kid. So I've seen a lot of things change, come and go. And one of the things that stuck with me was high frequency packet. Even though it fell out of favor, in the 90s, especially when the internet came along. I think there's still a lot of utility in it, and I'm going to talk to you about that today. The world of amateur radio digital modes 
has changed a lot over the last 30 years. We've seen distinct periods of innovation and rapid uptake, only to find several years later, many of these new modes have disappeared into obscurity. Modes such as Amtor, Clover, and GTOR were very popular in the 1990s, but now you'd be very hard pressed to ever hear them on the bands. Even fairly recent modes such as PSK31 and MFSK16 have diminished due to the popularity of the somewhat loosely termed weak signal modes like JT65 and FT8. This trend for rapid contacts, often computer automated with very limited QSO exchange, is extremely popular with many amateurs today. I personally think this is a bit unfortunate for a number of reasons, not least of which are the minimal skills needed to do it. There is little to learn or improve upon, and while this may suit those who desire instant gratification, much is lost in the social realm when the computer makes all the decisions for you. I'm not here to tell you to stop using JT65 or FT8. I simply want to spread the message that there are other forms of digital amateur radio, which when you've had enough of the rapid fire modes, you might find you enjoy. I've been involved with HF packet radio for many years, and I'd like to tell you about how it works from a practical point of view and to state clearly for the record that it certainly isn't a dead mode. In the US, we are extremely fortunate that a group of amateurs back in the 1980s conceived, built, and continue to maintain a high frequency packet radio network on the 20 meter band. Network 105 has been in continuous operation since June of 1986. It was founded by Bert Amaro, Victor Echo 1 AMA, for the purposes of social interaction and technical improvement. In many ways, it really was the first Wi-Fi social media. Bert passed away in 2010, but his network survives. But it nearly didn't. The network is composed of individual stations and is always evolving over time. People come and go only to return a few months or even years later. For a while it was plain to many of us, a rapid uptake of the internet caused activity on network 105 to decrease. During these years there were just a few holdout stations that kept things going. It seemed that the network may disappear into history. But this trend turned around after 9-11, and I'm not exactly sure of the motivation, but after those terrible events of September 2001, we saw a marked increase of network activity, and it's been growing ever since. We've also recently seen amateurs joining us who are concerned with net neutrality, and while Network 105 is certainly never going to be a replacement for the internet, it does provide a level playing field for all stations. It would be totally wrong to consider the network as a replacement for the internet. The limited bandwidth and speed of packet radio, plus the vagaries of HF propagation, rule this out. However, there is one unique aspect which keeps us there. The network requires no infrastructure other than your own HF transceiver, a computer, and antenna to operate. There's something almost magical about being part of a large social network unencumbered by internet or cable fees or regulations. It is not elitist in any sense, and all are welcome. The only price of admission is a little technical knowledge to get started and a desire to learn as you go. So let's take a look at some current activity. Uh, this map I created by observing the network for about two days. The stations which form the network are marked by a blue circle. The little colored blocks represent two or more stations geographically close to each other. There are definite clusters of activity where packet radio is popular. From monitoring, it's clear that Colorado seems to have the greatest density of stations. Each of these stations form part of the HF network. They may simply be a single amateur running no more than a chat terminal, or it may be a BBS station, i.e. a store and forward bulletin board system. 
or they could be what's called a node, which is a special type of station which allows packet switching, often providing a gateway to other geographical areas or onto other bands. Quite often, a single station will run all of these services simultaneously. Currently, the extent of the HF network reaches the entirety of the US, parts of Canada, Ireland, Puerto Rico, and Costa Rica. There are also numerous VHF stations which form part of the network too because they are in range of an HF node station. But the VHF stations are not shown on this map because they're too numerous. Every day stations come and go as people join or leave the network, so it's constantly changing size and coverage. So let's briefly explore the types of stations you can encounter on the network and understand how you can tell which station is which. Each station periodically sends out a beacon which usually indicates the functions or services provided by that station. The method used to distinguish different services provided is by use of the SSID, the Secondary Station Identifier. The FCC allows us to append an SSID to our call sign. We use it to differentiate different functions our station is capable of. It is a number between 0 and 15 added to the base call sign. The de facto standard for the network is as follows. When there's no SSID or dash 0, that means you can connect to the base call sign. The intention is to chat with the station operator. Um, it is also commonly the Digipeter SSID. When you see an SSID of dash one, it indicates that a personal mailbox or BBS is active on that station. An SSID of two is not used much but it indicates what's known as a cross-port digipeter. Usually this is implemented by just certain TNCs like Cantronics. An SSID of seven is probably the one most useful for most people, and that means that a node is operating at the station. It can simultaneously function as a cross-port digipeter for AEA and TimeWave TNCs like the CAM Plus or the software TNC BPQ32. An SSID of 10 is actually discouraged on the network for regular use because it indicates there is a WinLink gateway operating which can be used to send and receive email to the WinLink 2000 system and the internet. But it would only really be used in an emergency if it was necessary. An SSID of dash 11 usually signifies that a multi-user chat server is operating. You're listening to an excerpt from a digital radio forum held at the 2018 Dayton Hamvention. We'll continue Sholto Fisher's K7TMG's presentation about high-frequency packet, then and now, in a moment. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Occasionally you'll run into stations with different SSIDs than listed here, but that's usually because the station forms part of another network and it would be awkward for them to actually change their existing SSIDs. Although this is a pretty good rule of thumb, occasionally you will see differences. Most stations do conform to the standard, uh, so you can usually have a good guess, even if you haven't seen the station's beacon just by knowing what SSIDs are there. We should try and talk a little bit more about what makes Packet unique and what digipeters are and that type of thing if you've never come in contact with them before. But the simplest form of a packet network is a digipeter network. As its name suggests, it operates in a similar manner to a regular voice repeater. Because of HF propagation, station A cannot hear station C. Station B can hear both, so it's in an ideal location to act as a bridge between both stations A and C. A digipeter is a very basic packet repeater. When it decodes a packet destined for another station, which includes some information to indicate that it should be digipeted, it will transmit the same packet to the other station. 
the information to indicate a packet should be repeated is called the path. It can include one or more station call signs to act as digipeters. In this example, I'm sending a packet with the text hello world to EI2GYB in Ireland. I specified a, a digipeter path of KB9PVH and VE1JOT. When KB9PVH decodes my packet, retransmission occurs and the packet slightly altered to indicate it has been digipeted. When VE1JOT decodes the packet, it recognizes that it should also retransmit the packet. If EY2GIB decodes the packet, he understands the path back to me is via VE1JOT and KB9PVH. So that's very simply how a digipeter works. And I'm going to now tell you about a node because we no, really, no longer really use digipeting. The problem with the digipeated network is it just doesn't work very well on HF. There's too much chance that one of the stations in the digipeated path won't decode the packet. The other problem are retries and acknowledgements must be handled end to end, i.e. they traverse every station in the digipeated path. A better solution was needed and this is called the node. In some ways, similar to a digipeter, the node allows two stations who can't hear each other to connect. Unlike a digipeter, the node has a memory buffer and accepts multiple packets for the connected stations. Acknowledgements and retries are done by the node rather than end-to-end -end like the digipeter. This is much more reliable and efficient on HF. It's possible to connect to multiple nodes in turn and so in this way create a network and have the ability to travel along it. When you connect to a node, your own SSID will decrease by one automatically and the node will use your call sign and this new SSID to make outgoing connects. This is to prevent the wrong station from replying or the, the wrong SSID. There are only 15 SSIDs available. Your SSID at the first node will become minus 15 because your SSID when connecting was zero and it wraps around to minus 15. If you connect to another node, then it will become minus 14 and so on. In the example case, 7TMG is connected to W1ABC through two different nodes. If K7TMG sends data to W1ABC, the retries and acknowledgements are done between each of the neighboring stations and the data travels along the network until it can be delivered to W1ABC without error. Remember that packet radio is time division multiple access. So many stations can be on frequency at the same time and each has a time slot when it can transmit. Now, I'm not going to delve any deeper into the nuts and bolts of, of packet radio AX25 networks. As long as you've got a basic understanding of digipeating and nodes, you really have all the skills necessary to use the network successfully. So, enough of the theory, how do we use the network? In order to operate HF packet radio, you're going to need some form of modem. This can be a hardware TNC, like the, the old-fashioned PK-232s or the CAM Plus, or you can use a modern software program, such as UC7HO's sound modem. Even some multi-mode digital programs like MultiPSK and MixW have a packet radio mode available. If you have a modern, fast Windows PC, then I'd recommend the software modem because it easily outperforms the decoding ability of the old hardware modems. I think it's also easier to configure and understand, especially for those just getting their feet wet with packet radio. There are some advantages to the older modems, however. They can be left on when the computer is turned off. They can be used on ancient computers. That old PC in the back of the shack could be used again. Also, many of them contain firmware which enables you to make your own node and set up your own personal mailbox. 
Nodes can be configured to work with the software modem too, but it's harder to implement as they require complex configuration. We'll look at some of the important network parameters. There's just a few parameters to remember, and these have been selected over the years for maximum efficiency. First, make sure you're on the correct frequency. What you set the dial on your radio to will depend what type of modem you're using. Cantronics modems uses tones at 1600 hertz and 1800 hertz, but the PK232 has tones at 2210 and 2310 hertz. So this accounts for the different dial frequencies. The software modem introduces much greater variability as its waterfall cursors can be placed anywhere within the audio passband. In practice, it will be fairly easy to tune the software modem as you'll be able to see each packet on the waterfall and place your cursors appropriately. Once you're satisfied with the tuning, you'll want to make sure your modem is configured correctly with the network parameters. And as I said, there's only really a few critical ones. You have one called PACLEN, which is the packet length or size in bytes. Max frame, which is the maximum number of frames to send at once. We discovered on HF that trying to send more than one frame at a time is pointless. So that's why we say use a max frame of one. The FRAC is a timer. It's the frame acknowledgement time and it actually indicates the length of time you'd wait for an acknowledgement from another station. D-weight is a delay for digipeated packets. It doesn't really matter, but you specify zero for that. There's no, because there's very little latency on HF, there's no need to have a delay there. And then the actual board rate we use on air. For HF, we use 300 board. The fastest speed we can use under the current FCC regulations with this type of modulation. And that concludes a fairly lengthy look at high frequency packet radio then and now with Sholto Fisher, K7TMG a long-time high-frequency packet enthusiast and employee with West Mountain Radio today. The RAIN report is copyright 1990-2018. RAIN, all rights are reserved. This hamcast updates Saturdays on therainreport.com and can be heard around 9 p.m. Saturday evenings Central Time on shortwave from Lebanon, Tennessee on WTWW 5.085 MHz, now for you old-time packeteers, I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP, bidding you a very 73 from the Radio Amateur Information Network. Keep on hamming. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. As part of the upgrades to the ARIES program, ARRL will phase out traditional hard copy report forms later this year in favor of an online system, ARIES Connect, a new volunteer management, communication, and reporting system. The system in beta testing since March in four ARRL sections with large ARIES organizations will allow ARIES members to log information for ARRL field orgs handling but does not change how ARIES serves partner organizations. At the Hamvention ARRL Membership Forum in May, Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, who chairs the ARRL Public Service Enhancement Working Group, discussed dramatic changes occurring among agencies in the emergency disaster response sector and the transition to ARIES Connect. In his presentation, ARIES Advances into the 21st Century, a new program, Williams outlined the vision for the ARIES com comprised of organized, trained, qualified, and credentialed amateur radio operators who can provide public service partners with radio communications expertise, capability, and capacity. Goals include aligning the ARIES organizational structure with a national incident management system and incident command system. Emergency coordinators will continue to lead local ARIES teams during an incident with support from district and section emergency coordinator. Changes would encompass additional mandatory training to include ARRL emergency communications courses and the now standard FEMA NIM SCC courses IS-700, IS-200, 100 with the IS-300 and 400 for higher levels. Other specialty training could include Skywarn and agency-specific programs. 
Training levels attained would dovetail with three new levels of Ares participation. Level 1 would be comprised of all entering the program with no training, while progressing through the ARRL Emergency Communications Training and the FEMA Independent Study Courses. Level 2 would be attained upon successful completion of those courses and would be considered the standard level for Ares participants. Level 3 would be obtained upon completion of the Advanced FEMA courses, IS 300 and 400, which would qualify candidates for ARES leadership positions. Level 1 participants would be able to fulfill most ARES duties, with a target of attaining Level 2 in one year. Level 2, the standard participant level, would part permit participant access to most incident sites and emergency operations centers. Level 3 would convey full access, as granted by the authority having jurisdiction, plus qualification for ARES leadership. It's been proposed that ARRL provide a basic ARES ID, which would convey recognition of registration with ARES nationally, and indicate level of training, but convey no guarantee of site access. The authority having jurisdiction in an incident could grant an additional ID pass for site access. The ARRL headquarters staff is undergoing training in ARES Connect administration, with group registration underway and IDs assigned. ARES-related publications are also being updated, along with an ARIES strategic plan and introductory announcement, an article on ARIES enhancements, once they have been approved by the ARRL Board of Directors, is set to appear in the September 2018 issue of QST. Experimental operations now underway on HF appear aimed at leveraging low-latency HF propagation to shave microseconds from futures market trades and gain a competitive edge in a field where millionths of a second can mean winning or losing. Bloomberg Financial on June 18th reported on a secretive antenna facility near Maple Park in Kane County, Illinois, and speculated that futures traders might be looking to take advantage of lower latency HF propagation over state-of-the-art microwave links and undersea cables where even the slightest path delay could compromise a transaction. The facility is not far from a major futures data center. As the Bloomberg article explained, rapidly sending data from there to other important market centers can help the speediest traders profit from price differences for related assets. Those money-making opportunities often last only tiny fractions of a second. Radio amateur Bob Van Valza, KE9YQ, said in a May blog post that he recently stumbled onto the first evidence of HF Radio Futures trading at a site in West Chicago, Illinois. There he spotted HF log periodic dipole arrays on a pole, and a microwave dish he determined was aimed at a Chicago Mercantile Exchange data center. Additional research led him to the antenna facility in Maple Park, Illinois, which also sported a microwave dish that appeared aimed in the direction of the CME data center. Two approximately 170-foot towers on the site support a directional wire array for HF. Van Valza is a performance engineer on leave from the high-frequency, no pun intended, trading field. Bloomberg said the company behind the Kane County project is New Line Networks LLC, a joint venture of Chicago-based Jump Trading LLC and New York-based Virtu Financial Incorporated. While no FCC Part 5 experimental license appears to have been assigned to New Line Networks, WH2XVO is assigned to partner Virtu Financial, which assumed the license from Services Development Company, LLC. Sites listed on the license are Aurora and Chicago, Illinois, in addition to Homer, Alaska, and Secaucus, New Jersey, home to several financial firms and right across the Hudson River from many more in New York City. Part 5 Experimental License, WI2XAJ, has been assigned to Toggle Communications, which is using the West Chicago site and appears to be experimenting with a similar system from other sites. Other entities may also be conducting similar experiments. The experimental licensed systems use a variety of frequency shift keying modes, including FSK, AFSK, QPSK, and 8PSK, on frequencies ranging from about 6 MHz to 24 MHz, and power levels from 20 kW ERP to nearly 50 kW ERP, depending on the experimental license in question. 
Van Balza pointed out in his blog post that while HF is low bandwidth, unreliable, and expensive, you can't beat it for latency. Speculation is that the systems are taking advantage of software-defined radio techniques and technology. Transmitter equipment information on the experimental license application for WH2XVO was redacted from the public filing. ARRL reached out to the point of contact listed on the WH2VXO application, but has not heard back. Sweden's World Heritage Grimmiton radio station, SAQ Alexanderson Alternator, will be on the air July 1st on 17.2 kHz for its annual Alexanderson Day transmission. Three transmissions are scheduled, startup and tuning at 0815 UTC, message transmission at 0845, startup tuning at 1015 UTC, message transmission at 1045, and startup and tuning at 1215 UTC. Message transmissions continue at 12.45 UTC. All three transmission events will be available via YouTube. Amateur radio station SK6SAQ will be active on CW at 7.035 MHz or 14.035 MHz or single sideband at 3.755 MHz with two operating positions planned. Send reports to SAQ and SK6SAQ via email or the Bureau. The World Heritage Grimmiton radio station site will be open to the public on Alexanderson Day. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. I wanted to take some time to cover some of the common topics related to installing antenna systems on towers. First, let's examine designing and installing an antenna mount for the side of a smaller tower like the one in your yard. I have built a few homemade mounts out of scrap pieces of steel, usually built from a three-quarter inch steel pipe about three feet long and three steel bars about one to two inches across, maybe a quarter inch thick. Material like this can often be purchased off the shelf from your local hardware store or welding shop. You will need to climb the tower to measure the sizes and dimensions of the tower, legs, and diagonal members where you intend to mount the sidearm you're building. If you do not have access to a welder, have the shop weld together the mount with the ends of the straps onto the pipe, with about a, a foot between the straps, which would be centered on the three-foot pipe. This will give you about a foot above and below the straps onto which you can side mount or end mount an antenna. Pre-drill the holes for U-bolts to mount the straps onto the tower legs. Then also do the same for the U-bolts at the furthest end of the straps from the mounting tube. This mount should be set across one entire face of the tower so it can be hinged inward during mounting or servicing. After the mount is set in place and the antenna is set on the mount, the third support strap can be clamped to the mount and tower to reduce wobble. This is not a suitable mount for a wide tower unless you intend to mount the antenna close to the tower. The most common rule for mounting distance is one half wavelength from the closest face of the tower. If done properly, would make the tower nearly electrically transparent to the incoming or outgoing signals. If you draw a sine wave on a piece of paper, you'll notice that the voltage at one half wavelength is zero. This is why we prefer to mount antennas at multiples of one half wavelength. At two meters, that equals one meter out, or 39 inches from the antenna to the closest face on the tower. Imagine the sidearm necessary for six meters. At 224 megahertz, it equals about 24 inches for a half wave distance. If you have done all your measurements accurately at the mounting site, you can assemble the entire structure on the ground and make sure it all fits before taking any of it into the air. Since my homemade mounts usually weigh less than 15 pounds, I usually carry them up the tower with me, set them in place, then bring up the antennas and feed lines. This plan would change depending upon the height of the tower, other antennas on the tower, or how you feel about carrying cargo up the side of the tower safely. Sometimes it's easy, other times there would be too much risk of touching other active antennas, which would make hoisting the mount and antenna by rope from the ground necessary. It is obvious here that pre-planning is essential to ensure safety and reduce the number of trips up and down the tower. While I have promoted the idea of wearing cargo up the tower, 
I'm the first to admit that limiting trips on the tower and hours on the tower are the real goal in any job I do. Limiting both man hours and movement will also limit the risk of death, which is cool. I've seen a few different methods of securing amateur size coax to a tower leg. The most common I've seen is regular plastic electrical tape. The biggest problem with electrical tape is its lifespan. Mother Nature works to remove the sticky from electrical tape within the first half year. I've also seen cable ties used. As far as I know, clear or white cable ties are not made to survive sunlight, ozone, or Mother Nature's worst, which limit these to about seven months or less, especially if they are flexed regularly. I think the black cable ties are the best for outdoor mounting. Lastly, I've seen 12 gauge solid wire with insulation cut to five inch lengths and wrapped around the tower leg and coax, then twisted. I know this type of scrap material to hold coax to a tower leg for decades with no visible sign of aging. I have also seen a black cable tie over several layers of electrical tape. And coax can change size during the length and length during the day, so always allow for these changes. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Indian Express newspaper reports on the invisible warriors who battle Mumbai monsoons, radio amateurs. The forces on the front lines of Mumbai's monsoon crisis management have a set of images that define their functions. The fire brigade invariably rescues youngsters stranded out in the sea at Bandra Fort, Employees of the BMC clear out fallen trees, guard open manholes, and disinfect mosquito breeding spots. Hospitals witness queues of patients with waterborne diseases. The police are seen standing in waist-high water diverting traffic, and the National Disaster Response Force frantically remove rubble from collapsed buildings working to save lives. All the while, there is no such picture to define the importance of a band of invisible volunteers who pull the strings from the sidelines and ensure that lines of communications between the agencies never break down. For close to half a decade, ham or amateur radio operators have worked side by side with the BMC during monsoons. While they are kept on standby by the civic body in case a disaster or torrential rain knocks down electricity and phone services, the amateur radio operators also perform a vital function by relaying information from all corners of the city on days with forecasts of rough weather. This is a technical hobby, and our expertise is special, which common people do not have. During a disaster, communications are very important, says Grant Road resident and ham operator Sudhir Shah, VU2SVS, a manufacturer of go-karts. The 71-year-old usually oversees operations from the BMC's Disaster Management Control Room, which has its own transceiver, directing his colleagues on the field in other parts of the city. While phones and hotlines ring off the hook inside the control room and bring information from all corners of the city, Shah's messages have a far greater reach. This is a secondary channel of communication. We are highly mobile and independent. We are a voluntary service and use our own equipment and are always on standby, he adds. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on the amateur bands all around North America and around the world on great low-power radio stations like World FM on 88.2 MHz, serving Auckland, New Zealand. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. 
Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.